Thank you all for joining us here at I-80 Sports, where today we're talking about is it time to panic in New York and other news and notes around the NHL. Thank you all for joining us here again at I-80 Sports. Make sure that you follow us at our website, i80sports.com. Make sure you also follow us on Twitter at I-80 underscore sports NHL, where we're getting more and more followers each week, and we'd love for you guys to follow us here. So please make sure that you check out the Twitter down below. And if you would be so kind as to like, comment, and subscribe for more content, not just related to the NHL, but today, monumental day for I-80 sports as we introduced NBA coverage to i80 sports make sure you check out that coverage and much more new content that's going to be coming along for i80 sports there's a big game this sunday in football so i know you're going to want to check out our nfl video this week and there's also mls coverage and college football coverage on this channel as well so if you're a fan of those make sure that you follow for more i'm brian he's tom as always tom how you doing today doing all right uh you know staying in from the snow uh unfortunately we have a ranger centric show coming up and for all the wrong reasons yes yes we do in fact and actually our background uh to our video today is very appropriate because at least in the great state of new jersey there is quite the nor'easter going on outside so for those of you that do live in new jersey in the tri-state area make sure that you're safe we appreciate if you stay off the roads today even if it's just to get a donut you know be smart as always. But speaking of being smart, we're going to dive into some NHL news before we dive into the panic index of New York. Or should I say right now for the NHL news, the panic index that is COVID-19 because just last week, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights were placed under COVID protocol. And uh, we are going to be slightly breaking this today, actually, uh, within the past 30 minutes, actually. The New Jersey Devils have now been placed under COVID-19 protocol and their games have been postponed at least through february 6th so that's at least through saturday and with the following devils that are currently on uh protocol here are names that were already on the protocol list as of sunday night mackenzie blackwood connor carrick aaron dell kyle palmary and travis ajak and sorry and sammy Votnin. those were names that were already on the COVID protocol list but added to that list today you can now add andreas jansen yanni kuokinen michael mcleod and pavel zaka uh tom this is a pretty hairy situation not just for the devils not just for vegas but this is uh going to be hairy for all divisions going forward this is going to be something that we've alluded to the past couple weeks your thoughts tom well, we've already seen it happen in Dallas and Carolina, and I guess the unfortunate part about it is, is like I've said in previous episodes, this is just the, the, the truth of the world we're living in right now. It, it's sad, but it's true. It's just the truth of the world we're living in right now. It, it, these things happen not on purpose. You know, I mean, with Washington last week, yes, but these, these things just happen. It's sad, but it's just what we're living in right now. We just got to hope these guys either have no symptoms or mild symptoms. You know, they're back on the ice and back playing soon. We knew coming into this that certain things like this would happen, that games may maybe have to be canceled, that games would maybe have to be pushed back. So it's very unfortunate, but it's not really surprising if that makes any sense. No, it's true. And it's 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 the new normal for the NHL and as for a lot of uh, sports organizations right now. So as we always say on behalf of IED Sports, we hope that anybody that is currently affected with COVID-19 uh, whether it's to the New Jersey Devils, whether it's for the Vegas Golden Knights, and yeah. even also for Minnesota Wild forward right now, Marco Rossi, who is really going through quite the bout with it. Uh, we hope that all get well soon and that there are is nothing bad to come of this, uh, certainly. Uh, we mentioned last week that there was going to be a little bit that we were going to talk about with Patrick Laine, but... Ironically, the news out of New York has kind of overshadowed that. So we're going to mention it here in NHL Notes. Um, so for those that haven't been keeping up with the Patrick Laine uh, saga from last week, from when he was dealt in the Patrick Dubois deal, sending Patrick Laine to Columbus along with Jack Roslevic uh, in exchange for Pierre-Luc Dubois going to Winnipeg, uh, more news is coming out uh, on the lines of Patrick Laine. Uh, that forward black, uh, black Blake Wheeler 
Uh, never treated line A very well for numerous reasons. One of those reasons that was highlighted was uh, the fact that line A uh, was a finish forward that could potentially overshadow the popularity of another finish forward that played for the Winnipeg Jets not too long ago in Tamu Salami. And Blake Wheeler also had a hand in not necessarily hazing, but demanding a lot out of Patrick Line as a forward for the Winnipeg Jets. Apparently, Mark Shifley felt the same way. Blake Wheeler has come out and uh, has expressed his remorse for how he has handled the Patrick Line situation, saying he could have wished that he treated him better while he was in Winnipeg, but it sounds like it's a little too little too late based on what's coming out. Tom, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think <clears throat> Mike Wheeler kind of treated him a little unfairly? Yeah, my thoughts are this is a little ridiculous now. We're in the 21st century. It's 2021. I don't understand what the hazing thing is about. Back in the day when there were six teams and only about six teams and say uh, however many jobs. I'm not going to do the math in my head right now because it would just be a big waste of time for everybody here. It, it's wrong. It's wrong. And, and, and I mean, as far as the Tamo Solani thing goes, was he teammates with Tamo Solani? Was Tamo Solani his best friend? I can guarantee you that Blake Wheeler and Tamo Solani probably never even met each other. So I don't understand that. That, that you, you know that 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 uh, the more I hear about what's going on with this, it's a little more ridiculous. There's no part of hey, I mean, granted, I know these guys are professional athletes and they're paid to play the game and they're men that have to take it. There's no part. There's no. How do I say this? There's no place for hazing anywhere in any sport today. A couple of years back, and I'm going to bring this up. It's got nothing to do with the Jets, nor Line, nor Wheeler. Actually, it does have something to do with where a place where Wheeler was, and I wish he would have learned about this. And it was in Boston when Zidane Chara had first gotten to Boston and was named the captain. Chara caught veteran players hazing rookie players. Chara came in. The rookie player thought he thought that he Chara was going to turn on him. Chara grabbed the veteran player by the throat, threw him into the stall, and said, "This doesn't happen here. We're all on the same team. We're teammates. We're a team. We're all together in this." Yeah, I find you doing this again. I'm going to kick the shit out of you. Excuse my uh, French there. We may have to edit that out. But um, uh, I'm going to kick the crap out of you. We'll edit that part, but the point is, is that there's no, there's no, there's no room for this in today's game. How, we've heard what happened with Akeem Alou. What's going on in these junior hockey? What's going on with these junior hockey teams? You know, this is ridiculous. This is beyond ridiculous. How this is happening? I don't understand. What do these guys get out of it? If you think that this young kid is going to be so much better than you, then try to play better than him. Don't try to scare him into quit into quitting. That's beyond ridiculous. I'm sorry. No, it's true. And there's no place in any professional organization or even amateur organization when we're talking about the NCAA in a lot of cases. Uh, there's no place for hazing these days. I mean, you could make the argument, okay, boys will be boys, you know, back in the day. But you know what? That argument didn't work then. It's not going to work now. You know, cut the malarkey at this point. You know, cut it, deal with it, and move on. You know, Blake Wheeler. He's going to have his regrets, but what's done is done. You can't necessarily take back your actions. You can't necessarily take back your words. You can only hope to grow from it, which I really do hope that Blake Wheeler does grow from this because that's the best thing that you could do in response to this is grow from it and learn from it and be a better person because of it. So that's what I hope happens from this situation. But without further ado, we're going to be moving on from our NHL news right now. And Tom, it's time. I know you don't want to talk about it, but it's time. <laughs> Is it time to panic in New York? Now, when we are talking about New York right now, we're not talking about the New York Islanders. Oh, no, no, no. I think I think Tom wishes we were talking about the Islanders <laughs> in this situation. And I honestly thought that that's who we would be talking about at this point in the season. But as it turns out, we're talking about the Rangers. So why are we talking about panic in New York right now? Well, it's because the Rangers right now are 2-4-2 two, and two in their last eight games. That's good for six points in the Metropolitan Division, which unfortunately lands them dead last in the division. So it seems like a very small sample size, I know. I know a lot of people are going to be saying, Brian, it's eight games. We're only eight games in. Why are we stressing so hard about this? In an 82-game season, eight games is nothing. In a 56-game season, eight games is a lot more significant than you can actually imagine. And a lot of this panic kind of attributes to a couple factors right now. So one factor is starting goaltender Igor Shosturkin, which there's a little bit of cause for uh, panic because he's been inconsistent at best so far. Uh, I've got some stats here from HockeyReference.com. Uh, five games played, he has one win, 
two losses and one loss in overtime. He has 12 goals allowed on 113 shots, which is good for a 273 goals against average and an 894 save percentage. That's pretty rough so far for a goaltender that a lot of people have been hyping to be a potential Vezina favorite this year. So that's a little bit of a rough start so far. Uh, Quinn has also made some very interesting decisions in overtime uh, and uh and not even just in overtime, in the lineup in general. Uh, though, he did finally send Alexis Lafreniere uh, out there for three-on-three. Three, and, oh, look at that. He scored. Huh. How about that? You give the kid a little bit of time. Like, he could actually contribute to your team? Wild. But, unfortunately, that's not what we're all going to be tuning in about in terms of the panic in New York. No, no, no. We need to address the elephant in the room. Tom, you ready to address the elephant in the room in this situation? Oh, you better believe it. Oh, you better believe it because I have been waiting for this because I have never been truly a fan of this person. Uh, and that's just my personal bias, but we'll set that aside for right now. I'm just going to state out some facts when it comes to this person. That person's name is Tony D'Angelo, uh, formerly Anthony D'Angelo. <laughs> what a dumpster fire of a situation this is. All right, let's dive in. So not only did he stir up political drama in the off season, but he apparently got into a fight uh, with his own teammates and took his aggression out on Saturday night uh, against his starting goaltender from Saturday night, Alexander Georgiev. Now here are the details that we know. So it's said that Keandre Miller came in between the both of them between D'Angelo and uh Georgiev to break up the fight uh and this is the part that is allegedly it could be true it could not be true but i actually tend to kind of believe this one based on uh this particular player it's also said that the fight was also broken up by chris Kreider uh intervening and punching d'angelo in the face so if that really did happen good on you Kreider. i knew i liked you so uh Management has certainly had enough with Tony D'Angelo at this point. Uh, he has officially been waived uh, by the team, and he officially cleared waivers today, which is uh, certainly a sign that no team wants to deal with him at this point and what is currently coming out. Now, D'Angelo also has a, a history of you know, on and off ice behavior, specifically dealing with racism. Uh, he was suspended by his junior coach when he was playing for the Sarnia Sting for using racial slurs on the ice against teammates and opponents. But why is this important? Because he has apparently been exhibiting the same behavior with rookie teammate Keandre Miller, who has already dealt with racism as early as his first press conference in the NHL. Uh, teammates have apparently voiced their concern about his treatment of Miller. Uh, D'Angelo apparently took the puck from Miller's first NHL goal, which is a pretty dirty move to be honest, to, you know, take away somebody's, you know, first NHL goal puck. That's really not nice. I mean, to me, I mean, could dumping D'Angelo help turn the tide for the Rangers? I mean, what else needs to be done? Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you because you're our resident Rangers fan here. What do you think about this entire situation? What do you think can be done? Do you think the D'Angelo waving is the turning of the tide? You have the floor. Well, I have never been a fan of Tony D'Angelo. Um, I haven't spoke much about him on here just because a lot of what we were doing was playoffs and offseason. We haven't really had a lot of the season to talk about it. Granted, a lot of people were bowing down and kissing D'Angelo's feet last year saying he was a 70-point defenseman and blah, 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 blah. Okay, good for him. The guy can't play on the other side of the puck. Calling him the next Brian Leach is crazy. The guy's never even going to sniff in the worst trophy in his life. You know, he's been a locker room problem just about everywhere he's gone. Um, you know, st whether, whether the stuff with Miller is true or not, I don't know. I was reading some more stuff today saying that him and Miller were fine. Apparently, Miller got in, tried to break up the fight, and he started cursing out Miller, which led to Jacob Truba getting involved, too, and grabbing D'Angelo, and when he... D'Angelo went on Mil at Miller, apparently cried or punched him in the face. How true that is, I don't know. I'm not going to speculate. That's something that I don't know about. But he really has been a problem. He seems to have been a bigger problem this year. He seems to have been walking around in a lot of places, especially true Ben Kreider, but walking around and are not a fan of him. Walking around like he's some football player, some basketball player, some multimillionaire guy walking around saying, look at me, I made it. Look at me, I made it. And I don't want the government taking my money away has been sort of his, um, uh, his MO this year. Kreider and especially Truba have told him numerous times to tone it down, tone it down, tone it down, tone it down. He won't tone it down. 
He keeps going around saying, I've made it, I've made it, I can do what I want, I've made it. That's that's wrong. That is the anti-hockey player right there. Hockey players, from what I've seen in the past, are some of the most selfless athletes in the world. It's always we, it's always us, it's never I, 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 I. Look at Wayne Gretzky. You never even saw him do anything like that. So, I mean, I think his time is up here, unfortunately. I really did I really did think that he had changed last year. I thought he was finally going to turn the corner, finally going to maybe become a better player. But I guess not. And I was saying all throughout last year when he was having that great season that they need to get rid of him. And I was saying all last year, we were like, well, who's going to be better than him? Who's going to, who's going to replace him in that spot? Who's going to be the better player? And I said last year, all last year, I said Adam Fox. And what we're seeing this year, Adam Fox, is true. I'll delve more into that later. I'm going to leave that alone for right now. But unfortunately, Tony D'Angelo's time here is done. Right before we had gone on, I read a tweet from Darren Drager pretty much saying that Pat Brisson, who is Tony's agent, and Jeff Gordon, GM of the Rangers, have pretty much come to an agreement that Tony is going to stay home. He won't be practicing with the team. He won't be, he'll be on the taxi squad, but he won't be coming to practice. He won't be playing in any games. And he'll remain home until they can find a deal to send him somewhere. We'll see what happens. I mean, personally for me, I think this is the turning of the corner that the Rangers needed. It's obvious that this could could have possibly been a distraction on and off the ice uh, with what's been going on, which when any team's dealing with any kind of like bigger distractions, it's never good. The Devils dealt with the distraction of, well, is Taylor Hall going to get dealt, you know, and he, you know, him being left out of the lineup and kept playing badly, not Hall himself, but the team itself. And then finally, once Hall was dealt, once you finally, you know, changed the guard a little bit, Devils performed really, really well towards the end of the stretch. So maybe this is exactly what the Rangers need. But the only way to know is, you know, as the games are played. So hopefully the Rangers can kind of turn the tide this week and... We'll just kind of see what happens. So that's actually kind of a perfect segue in to our weekly fan corners, which I have actually titled for this week. So Tom's Rangers corner, my devil's den. So Tom, <laughs> as we all know, as we all know this way, <laughs> got to learn my stage hands. But Tom, as we know from here, uh, is a diehard Rangers fan to his detriment, and I myself am a diehard Devils fan to my detriment. So we're going to be talking about things that we liked this week about our respective teams. Tom, we are going to start with your Rangers corner, as we always do. So why don't you highlight the good out of the bad that we just talked about from this past week? What were some good things that you saw, dude? Well, the good... Artemi Panarin, once again, Panarin playing at over a point a game right now, really carrying the team, whether it be on the power play, whether it be even strength. Artemi Panarin, as advertised, like he was last year, as advertised, point per game player, still the best player on the team. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely playing better than what I thought. A lot of guys have that great first year in New York, and then they kind of taper off. Panarin has not been. Panarin's playing at the same level he was playing last year. Um, another good one, like I mentioned above, Adam Fox, still showing that he's that number one defenseman, showing that he can play in all situations. You know, two thumbs up for Adam Fox, a plus performance this week. And now I got to bring on the two kids, Alexi Lafreniere, K. Andre Miller, both scored their first goals this week. Lafreniere finally got a shot in overtime after I believe Quinn should have been playing him in overtime against Pittsburgh last Friday. I don't know why he didn't. You heard me rant about it. Maybe David Quinn's watching our show and said, hey, Maybe I want to put this guy in Thursday night. He might do something. Lo and behold, goes out there, scores a the game winner. Ke'Andre Miller also gets his first goal up in Buffalo last Tuesday. And Ke'Andre Miller, man, I got to say, I got to say, a lot of people thought he would be spending the year in Hartford this year. The guy looks like he's been in the league for five years. He looks like a solid top four defenseman, man. He can score. He can hit. He can play on both sides of the puck. I mean, what, what, what bad things can you say about this kid? And maybe that's what and, – and, and to say what I said about Tony D'Angelo before, maybe it's the jealousy. Maybe it's the fear in him. Maybe he feels that if he – he knows he can't strike fear into Adam Fox because Fox was there last year. But maybe what he was trying to do was strike fear into K. Andre Miller so we back off so, you know, he play worse. I, I, I don't know. But you know what? Miller doesn't seem to – it doesn't seem to be bothering him, bothering him that much. He seems to be playing fine. The bad, as we saw above, Tony D'Angelo, for whatever reason, he's not on the team anymore. He's no longer our problem. David Quinn, again, I just uh, – there, there's certain things he did. And there was another thing he did with Capo Caco on Thursday night. Caco was playing great up in Buffalo Thursday night. And then he admitted, we're like, well, why didn't you play Caco? Oh, I forgot he was on the bench. Forgot he was on the bench. 
This kid is like the cornerstone for this rebuild over the next couple of years. You've got to let this kid play. He has two goals this year. I mean, he should have more goals. You're pe- playing him 10 minutes a night, and everyone wonders why he's not doing things. You've got to get him on the ice more. Obviously, he saw more time Saturday night against the Penguins. I saw him playing on Panarin's line for a bit. He's got to let this kid play more. I don't know what his vendetta against Capo Caco is. I really don't know. Okay, I mean, he's not a rich college kid that you're coaching at BU. He's from Finland. He's a little bit of a different kid. Like, this guy has got to learn how to coach this kid. Or else he's going to ruin him or he's going to want to run him out of town and he'll be yet another kid that the Rangers drafted having success somewhere else. If it becomes between Kako and Quinn, then Quinn has got to go because there's a lot to this. There's a lot to Kako that we haven't seen yet that maybe if another coach was here, we'll really start seeing the player that he is and the player that he can become. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, with the Rangers right now, there are a bunch of bright spots. Like Panarin is a big bright spot. Pavel Buchnevich has also been a really good bright spot, setting up Panarin on multiple occasions at this point. He's got seven assists on the season, which is really, really nice to see. Want to see his offense get going a little bit more, but you know, still good stuff for the Rangers. All right, time for me to talk some Devils right now, which I hate to say it, this week I was slightly disappointed. And not overly disappointed like some Devils fans I saw were, but only slightly. And I'm only slightly disappointed because we were missing a chunk of the lineup. You know, this is a Devils team that was missing Heischer, that's still missing Blackwood, that is still missing Sammy Votnin. And in ways you could say that for a good chunk of the week, you were missing Travis Ajak, you were missing Kyle Palmieri in your last game of the week as well. And... Well, Devils are going to be missing some more time as is right now. So that's really, really disappointing and hope that things can get solved as we go. But some highlights here in terms of the disappointing parts. Scott Wedgwood had a rough week. He went 0-3 on the week against the Flyers in two matchups and against the Sabres. Uh, But to be fair, to be fair... The Flyers and the Sabres are very, very good teams. And teams that on paper are better than the devils currently. So this is not something that I was going to be overly bent out of shape about if the devils lost any of these matchups, I was going to be ecstatic if they won any of them, you know, they were hard fought matches. The devils found themselves in the game throughout all three matchups when Wedgwood was in, but just couldn't get anything going. That being said, in Sunday's game against the Sabres, uh, in the back-to-back, in the second game of the back-to-back games, goaltender Eric Comrie stepped in and delivered a much-needed win for the Devils and looked very good doing it. And he looked pretty good for a goaltender who hasn't started a game since December of 2019. So he really kind of shook off the rust in this game. He didn't look too bad doing so either, uh, quite frankly. I was surprised on how small he is, uh, but it's not overly concerning for me i'm not overly concerned about it and i think comry can be that goaltender that could potentially step in in those emergency situations just to remember eric comry not too long ago was seen as a very high prospect for the winnipeg jets and we'll see where it goes i mean i did not mind seeing comry in that maybe when things get back to normal obviously the Devils by that point could have Mackenzie Blackwood and Aaron Dell back. So we'll really kind of see where the backup situation is shuffled and we'll see where it goes. Uh, I mentioned last week. So now we're getting to the good of this thing and I'm excited to be talking about this. I mentioned last week how much I enjoyed the way the bottom six had played. And that continues this week because holy mo- moly, the fourth line, which uh, our fans and now NHL Dot com and NHL TV has now dubbed the bottom line BMW line. BMW for what? Bastion, McLeod, Wood. Nick Bastion, Michael McLeod, Miles Wood. Holy moly. I, I can't stop saying that. They're so good together. And they made life hell for every defense this week. They looked really good on Sunday. They produced four of the Five goals scored by the Devils on Sunday night. Uh, Two goals for Miles Wood. Two goals for uh, Mike McLeod. His first multi-goal game as well. And remember, Mike McLeod was a former first-round pick uh, a few years back at this point. But here's a message for Lindy Ruff, and I'm going to look straight down the camera on this one. 
Do not break this line up. You need to keep this line together. They are have so much chemistry together and it's so obvious right now that even when he sure finds his way back into the lineup you're not gonna get rid of mcleod or bastion at this point they looked great uh quick shout out also to another player that player that uh debuted yesterday mikhail maltsev which a lot of uh you know maybe not so wise devils fans maybe some uh fans that don't necessarily keep up with the AHL and uh, the devil's draft stock is probably looking at Maltsev and just like, who the heck is that kid? And why should I care about him? So with Maltsev, he's, a, he, he looked very good in his NHL debut. He might not have logged any kind of points on the board, but he looked very good and looked very comfortable in his first NHL game. Uh, he's a name to keep him in the back of your mind because he worked very hard in the AHL and looked really good in the AHL. And his real claim to fame is his hands. He has really, really silky mitts. And I want to see him get a good opportunity at the NHL level. Obviously for this week, it's, it's kind of squashed. So we'll kind of see if he can get back on track uh, in the following week, I'm hoping that the Devils can return in the following week, and we'll see what I have to talk about next week, to be honest. Hopefully, there's a little bit for me to talk about, but we could be kind of like steering clear of the uh, Brian's Devil's Den next week. We'll just kind of have to see mm-hmm. what happens at this point. But uh, now we're just going to get into some general NHL thoughts. I'll put up the NHL news banner just because on this one. So, Tom. What's your uh, highlight from this past week? What looked good to you? Uh, just watching that entire North Division, that entire Canadian Division. It's just it's great stuff. It really is. It's great stuff. These Toronto-Edmonton games have been great seeing McDavid and Dreisaitl go up against Matthews, Marner, and Lamars. It's just been some great hockey, great back-and-forth hockey. And, you know, it might be the first time since, say, 19 – oh, what am I going to say here? Since, like, early 1920s that, you know, you have Canadian teams just playing against Canadian teams. Since the Boston Bruins and Boston Bruins joined the league, there had the, it hasn't been an old Canadian uh, setup for a while. So it's just great. It's you know it's great to see these rivalries. You know it's great to just see you know just good passionate hockey up there. It's great stuff. And speaking of uh, a team up there, the Edmonton Oilers, you have McDavid and Drysaddle right now combined at the top of the league. They have forty three points combined. They have more points than the entire Anaheim Ducks roster combined right now. That's scary. That's really scary. And back to the another team that's got some offensive firepower, Toronto Maple Leafs, man. They're looking great right now. Great 7-2 and two record. You know, I think – I don't know if the Leafs have finally turned a corner yet. We're only nine games in. If it's like this maybe 19 games in or 29 games in or 39 games in, then maybe we have something to talk about, but we'll see. But, yeah, I mean, so far this Canadian division has been great. It's been great stuff to watch so far, especially with them, Toronto, with Edmonton, with Montreal. I watched a little bit of Vancouver this week. Vancouver's playing very well. So just great hockey all around, man. Great hockey. Yeah, and I agree. There's been some really, really great hockey been uh, being played in the Canadian division, except for one team right now. Unfortunately, <laughs> the Ottawa Senators are in pretty rough shape right now. Uh, they have the worst record in the NHL with only three points logged on the season. And it's not like they don't have talent. And it's not like they haven't been in these games. Yeah. So yesterday, they got smacked by Edmonton. Absolutely just utterly smacked by, I'll just call a spade a spade on this one. They were smacked by Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Like, they were smacked by the two of them. Not really anybody else. But despite, you know, giving up eight goals, they still potted five. They still had five goals on that game. So it's not like Ottawa can't generate offense. They can. They're making some questionable offensive decisions as well. I don't agree with the implementation of how uh, they've been sliding Tim Stutzla into the lineup, which finally got his first goal yesterday, so congrats to him on that. But, uh, yeah, I'm... I really don't like how they've rolled him out lately. I think they need to either just put him in or if they're not going to be confident about putting him into the lineup, send him back overseas. You know, if you're not going to use him properly, send him back. He's a guy that needs to be playing the minutes to be able to develop. It's the same argument that I make for Alexi Lafreniere as well. You need to give him those opportunities to really shine. When you don't, that's how you stunt a player's development, especially with somebody who's at such a high level. So 
you know, we'll see as the season develops. It's still earlier on next week. We are going to be talking a little bit more about where each team kind of stands in each division, you know, top teams in divisions, bottom teams in divisions, what each team needs to do to either continue momentum or generate some momentum. So that's going to be next week. But this brings us finally to our listener question of the week, which we've been doing this for a few weeks now, and this is going to be a regular uh, segment as we go along. So segment goes as follows. I either tweet out or send a Facebook message out saying, hey, What's the big story of the week? What is your question? biggest question in the NHL this week? And as I get the questions, I pick whatever is the question that we would like to highlight this week. So if you're lucky, your question could end up being highlighted on a future episode of I80 Sports NHL, which today our question comes from Peter. And I'm going to read this word for word on this one because, well, I just kind of liked what he had to say here. So Peter... Uh, question and statement is uh, first, and this is quote, first, I'm ecstatic that the Rangers wave Tony D'Angelo. He's a locker room cancer, in my opinion. Yay. Yay Peter. <laughs> my question is, I saw an article in the New York Post about the Rangers assigning players like Capo Caco and Kay Andre Miller to the taxi squad on off days so that their salary for those days don't count against the salary cap. It was very confusing, though. I assume they get their normal pay and it's yeah. just a cap thing. If they are getting less pay, wouldn't that cause uh, unhappiness amongst the players? I imagine other teams are doing the same. What are your thoughts? So Peter, that's a really, really good question. And actually something that I needed to do a little bit of research on. So yeah. Awesome question, Tom. I'm going to send this one over to you because this one actually kind of is more New York centric, which like I said in the past with these questions of the week, doesn't necessarily have to be related to the New York Rangers or New Jersey devils. It can be NHL related, which with this one is as much as it is related to the Rangers it is also related to the NHL also. So great question, Tom, I'm going to hit it to you first. So why would the Rangers do something like this? Uh, it's mostly just to save money uh, daily on the cap. The unfortunate part about it is guys like Kako and Miller um, all have two-way contracts and are eligible to be sent down to the minors or to be, you know, just put on the tax squad now since we don't have the minors. Um, it's really to save money. It, it, it cuts some money off the cap each day and it keeps them compliant. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much why they do it. It's to save a little bit of money uh, so they don't get nailed or they don't get penalized. Um the reason Lafreniere can't go on it is because right now the rule is with juniors, if you're under 20 and you're going to be sent down, you're sent back down to your junior team. So they can't do it Lafreniere because if they were to do it, he'd have to go back to Ramuski, which they don't want to do, obviously. With Kako and Miller, all you're doing is just saying, okay, you're on a taxi squad, and then the next day, okay, now you're not anymore. So, you know, um, that's pretty much why. Um, one more uh, bit of news about Kako. He actually was just added to the COVID-19 protocol. I just got that news literally about 45 seconds ago. Rough, 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 rough. But uh, yeah, this is uh, absolutely a cost-saving measure and it might seem minuscule, but over a course of an entire season, it does add up and it doesn't necessarily lead to unhappiness amongst players. The players also understand that, you know, over time, they're going to make this money back. You know, this is money that they're most certainly not really losing right now, but it's more so benefiting the organization because of the loss in revenue sales from ticket sales, which is a lot bigger than what a lot of people really understand and think. But this is a cost saving measure on a day to day basis. That's why you do see players that are sent to the taxi squad, so on and so forth. I remember when I first saw it and I saw Capo Caco sent to the taxi squad, I was just like, ha, he's a bust. But then, yeah, I read about it more. I'm just like, darn it. So close. <laughs> but that's exactly why. Peter, great question. And I hope that gives you a little bit more clarity on that particular question. And if you have future questions for those of our listeners out there, send us your questions. We want to hear them. We want to be able to highlight them on a weekly basis. And just because we don't highlight your question from, from one week, don't give up because there's always the next week and the week after that and the week after that and the week after that. So definitely try to get your questions out there for us. But that's going to just about do it for us here at IED Sports NHL. What do you guys think about the New York situation and other news and notes around the NHL, as well as our question of the week? Well, 
The way that you can let us know is by certainly dro dropping a like, dropping a comment, and also subscribing for more content. So that way you can stay up to date with everything that goes on in the NHL. And besides just the NHL as well, you can keep up with our NFL, MLS, NCAA football, and our brand new NBA basketball coverage as well. But we know that you want to be here for our NHL coverage. So make sure that you follow us on our website, i80sports.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at I 80 underscore sports NHL. I do my best to try to retweet some very important information as well as give you my two cents on things around the NHL as well. So certainly follow us on Twitter for more. And as always, I've been Brian. He's been Tom. This has been I 80 sports NHL. <laughs>